If you're coming from Bridgeport via I-95, take exit 24, turn right, then hang a left to go back up Black Rock Turnpike until you see Burroughs Road. Take that right, follow it down, past the house with the weird light up numbers, past the soccer field, and you'll reach Fairfield Woods Road. Go right again, then take your first left at the stop sign onto Morehouse Highway. Follow Morehouse until the end. The time I went this way with my boyfriend, Aaron, who was new to the area, he thought the only option at the bottom of Morehouse was to take a left. The route straight was obstructed by a locked metal gate covered with reflective orange tape, but I had a key. Behind the gate lies a small, poorly maintained road, which leads around and down to a wooded area on the rear end of Lake Mohagan. It's a man-made lake that was once a gravel quarry back in the 50s. The town of Fairfield bought the then defunct quarry in 1961 and routed the Mill River to fill it up, ultimately making a pleasant beach area for the locals. Once the quarry was full of water and the sand was brought in, the townsfolk came in droves. Both sides of the lake would attract bathers and sunseekers of all types. The main part of the lake always had three lifeguards on duty, but at the rear end of the lake, where it's fed by the river, there's a deceptively strong current and no lifeguard stations. After an unfortunate series of drownings in the 1970s, nearly all of whom were children, neither strong enough to swim away from the current nor smart enough to avoid fighting it, the town decided no one should swim on that side of the lake. Most people listened, some didn't, and some of them also drowned. The area remained popular though, especially the spot the locals called the Cascades. The Cascades consist of a series of minor waterfalls and rapids gushing through a narrow, rocky section about a mile up from where the river pours into the lake. The Cascades are surrounded by many square miles of woods, gifted to the town by the General Electric Company, whose corporate headquarters butts up against the far edge. On a bright, warm day, locals would enjoy walking through the woods along the well-marked paths. Some brave, albeit foolish ones, would dive from the highest ledge of the riverbank into the rushing water. Aside from the times when the water level was low, it was just deep enough for divers to avoid serious injury. When I was younger, the gate leading to the Cascades wasn't always locked. In fact, it was wide open from sunrise to sunset. Visitors were welcome to go inside, tour the woods, and walk along the river. After what happened that summer in 1987, though, town officials wanted to keep visitors to a minimum. It remained closed all throughout my childhood and adolescence, but my high school friends and I used to sneak in and explore. At the insistence of my parents when I turned 17, I got a job with the town's parks and recreation department doing basic maintenance and garbage collection. The pay was terrible, but I got to drive a big truck around, and I had tons of time to myself. I'd go from park to park, pulling gum from water fountains and tampons from swing sets and garbage from bins, then drive it over to the town dump at the end of the day. The dump had a big gate that was usually open, but after hours, it was closed to anyone who didn't have a key. Every maintenance worker employed by the town had one, and it was the same one that opened all the municipal gates in Fairfield including the one behind Lake Mohagan. Aaron and I pulled up to the gate. I got out, unlocked it, hopped back in the car, and we progressed down the crumbling roadway to a dilapidated parking area. We stepped out onto the cracked asphalt and hopped over the knee-high fence they erected to keep mountain bikers from terrorizing pedestrians on the trails. As we strolled through the woods towards the Cascades, we chatted and caught up. It'd been almost two months since we'd seen one another. I met Aaron online in an AOL chat room earlier in that year. It was a local chat for gay men in Connecticut, and we hit it off pretty much immediately. He was a year older than me and a student at UCONN. Most Friday evenings, I'd make the 90-minute drive up there. We'd have a great time. Then Sunday nights, I'd drive home and go to school the next morning, exhausted. My parents never had any issues with our relationship, aside from the initial concern that he might be some weird predator. They met him the first time he came to visit and discovered pretty quickly he was a good guy. Obviously, they made him sleep in the guest bedroom, but they had no problem with anything else. 
While we walked, Aaron marveled at the beauty of the woods and the rushing waters of the river. I told him he should see it when the water level isn't so low. It's almost scary how fast and deep the rapids near the Cascades can be after a storm. He asked me why the area was closed off to the public, so I told him the story. In the summer of 1987, the area was dealing with a pretty bad drought. On top of that, it was an inordinately hot summer, so Lake Mohegan was packed solid with townsfolk looking to beat the heat. All those combined factors led to a series of problems. First, the lake, which had lost a decent amount of water to the drought, was warm as bathwater and a perfect breeding ground for all sorts of nasty things. Leeches were first, but only in one area to the far left of the lifeguard chairs. Then there was an algae bloom on the back side of the lake, which despite every warning, didn't scare bathers away. A few got sick, and one, who we later learned was an early and unaware carrier of the AIDS virus, died from a specific type of infection they assumed he picked up at the lake. When the conditions at Lake Mohegan deteriorated to the point where most people didn't want to go into the water anymore, the river and the Cascades became the new hotspot. Since the river was always flowing, there was no algae or threat of infections from stagnant water. However, the water level was dramatically lower than usual. Divers usually cannonballed or belly flopped from the rock walls and safely splashed into the water, but every so often someone would jump straight down and get hurt. Most of the injuries were limited to badly lacerated feet and toes, but every couple days there'd be at least one broken ankle. There were calls from the town to close off the area until the water level was higher, but all they did was put up a few signs that said, dive at your own risk, with a silly illustration of someone diving and cracking their head open. As the summer wore on and the drought got worse, so did the injuries. It culminated in a tragedy that made national news. A hideously stupid father and mother, while being videotaped by a relative, laughed and waved to the camera before diving head first off the ledge as they held the hands of their adult autistic son. <clears throat> a hideously stupid father and mother, while being videotaped by a relative, laughed and waved to the camera before diving headfirst off the ledge as they held the hands of their adult autistic son. All three smashed their faces into the rocks below and broke their necks. All three died. The subsequent investigation showed the water, which was normally just under eight feet deep at that spot, was barely five and a half. That incident prompted the indefinite closing of the Cascades. The town didn't put out guards or arrest anyone who ventured in, but the installation of the gate prevented cars from entering, and that eliminated the vast majority of visitors. Those seeking relief from the heat ended up going across town to Jennings and Penfield Beach, and that, for the most part, was that. Aaron had tears in his eyes when I mentioned the part about the autistic son. His uncle suffered from autism, and Aaron frequently spoke about the man's fragility. I changed the subject as our walk brought us to the cascades he'd been hearing about for the last 30 minutes. I could tell he was underwhelmed. Even though it was almost 80 degrees on that early April afternoon, the trees were still barren and unappealing to look at. The water level was pitiful. There'd been no snow during the winter and hardly any rain either, so the river, which usually raged at this time of year, as the snow melted, trickled pitifully. We peered over the edge of the cliff where the parents and their son had died. It looked no deeper than the five and a half feet it was on that day. I sighed and told Aaron I was sorry for building the whole thing up. His face brightened and told me it was no problem. He was happy to be spending time with me. I winked and told him I'd make it up to him anyway. I looked around. There was no one anywhere nearby. I kissed him and pulled him close to me. He was eager to return the affection and after about 45 seconds, we were naked and I was on my knees in front of him. When it was his turn to return the favor, I sat on the cool rocks on the side of the cliff and dangled my legs over the edge. He grinned and knelt beside me, moving his head downward with enthusiastic purpose. I let him perform for a minute or two, enjoying the sensation. Once I felt his mouth release me, I picked up the rock I'd sat next to and drove it into his head. Aaron's face dropped heavily into my lap as blood oozed from the chipped wreckage at the top of his skull. I dropped the rock into the water and pushed him off the cliff. He plunged face first into the shallow water 
his body stopping abruptly as his head struck the bottom. He tipped sideways and floated face down before getting stuck in a tangle of branches on the riverbank. Walking down to the riverbank, I flipped Aaron onto his back and pulled him ashore. He was undoubtedly dead. The exhilaration I felt was beyond anything I experienced before or since. I couldn't wait to tell the others. We'd been talking for a while about how we'd each do something like this, but I was the first to go through with it. Anna, Dimitri, and Lisa all eventually got their chances, and I'll be happy to tell their story soon, but let me wrap this up. I washed the small bit of Aaron's blood off my hand and thigh. Then I got dressed, took the keys from his pocket, and headed toward the lot. I drove over to the nearby church in Morehouse Highway and banged on the office door. An elderly clergyman opened it up and I told him, with sobbing panic in my voice, that my friend had gotten hurt in a diving accident. The police questioned me for a few hours, but I was released to my parents later that night. Aaron's death was ultimately ruled an accident. I played the grieving boyfriend for nearly six months before I felt it was safe to show I'd moved on. I can't believe it's been almost 20 years since that April afternoon. My husband has no idea. My kids have no idea. Nor will they. I had the opportunity of a lifetime and I was determined to seize it. One of the most amazing feelings in the world is to know you've gotten to satisfy a curiosity held by so many people, either incapable or too afraid to take action. My husband, Francisco, often says how proud he is of me. I know he's talking about my career advancement and how well I help raise our kids, but as he strokes my hair while we're snuggled in bed and tells me about the pride and love he feels, I tell myself it's because I'm willing to take that extra step toward success, toward the fulfillment of my dreams, and above all, toward self-actualization. Today's no sleep story comes from username Ia, and make sure to check out their website unsettlingstories.com. Thanks for watching, and sweet dreams.